and very pleased to welcome Zachary Ledger and then uh, Fleet Blakey. Thank you, and I'm going to pass it on to Zachary. All right, so uh, hi everyone, it's good to see some familiar faces. Um, Professor Helmy was very sorry that he could not make it today. Uh, very just last minute emergency. Uh, I am one of his graduate students. I've been working on on-chip entanglement generation and uh, we'll see later on some of the details. Uh, and I think we'll just jump right into it. Uh, so why do we want to use photons in the quantum world? Well, they have natural mobility. Uh, so something like um, electrons, they need to be basically moved around. This has uh, an ease of movement, low noise, quantum limited detection. It's quite ideal for pretty much all quantum paths, uh, anything like that. And then, so I'm starting off for a general audience. So what is entanglement? So we're talking about uh, what basically we want to be able to build on chip later on. So an unentangled pure state can be fully divided into two separate quantum states. Well, in, in an entangled state uh, would have to be represented as a sum of different pure states, and it is irreducible. Um, so one example of a unentangled pure state, basically just H and V, one photon H, one photon V, while a uh, entangled state might be represented like HV minus VH, a singlet state, uh, and it has correlations that exist over different bases. So I think most of you are probably familiar with something like this. Um, but then how do we generate these? So of course we have the most common way is nonlinear interactions, uh, either SPDC or uh, SPDC being spontaneous parametric down conversion or spontaneous four wave mixing, sorry. Uh, the four wave mixing was cut off by this image. Uh, basically, SPDC is when you have one higher, higher energy photon basically pumping a nonlinear interaction in a chi 2 medium or a nonlinear uh, medium. And so you're going to have a signal photon and an idler photon basically being emitted. While spontaneous forward mixing, you have one strong pump where there's two absorptions of the pump and then uh, two emissions at, uh, for signal and idler photons. This is a spontaneous process, meaning that uh, basically the signal and idler don't need to be triggered by an external source. So the only thing that comes in is the pump. And it's a parametric process, meaning that we're going back to the same output level as the input state. So the criteria to generate entangled photons, uh, we need to have energy conservation and phase matching. Uh, so the phase matching is, so energy conservation is basically just the sum of the energies needs to be the same. It's quite visible from something like this that we want the input energy and the output energy to be the same. While phase matching is slightly more complicated, uh, we want the different wave vectors uh, basically to sum to zero. So the wave vector of the pump needs to be equal to the wave vector of the signal and idler photons. However, there's a common issue where uh, basically the wave number can be described by the effective index n times the um, angular frequency, omega. But the absorption away from absorption peaks, basically the, refraction, the refractive index normally decays with smaller frequencies. So that means that basically in normal dispersion, um, 
you can't both at the same time have the sum of the frequencies be equal and the sum of the k vectors being equal. You'll need to basically engineer your phase matching to do something. So how do we resolve this? <coughs> Pardon me. So the most common way is probably birefringence. Different uh, polarizations will have different uh, indices, effective indices in the medium. There's also uh, periodic polling, where we see uh, the quasi phase matching curve uh, being the kind of wobbly curve at the, the second over here. And um, this would be a completely phase match uh, system. And down here, we have something that's away from phase matching. And then we have something called modal phase matching. So modal phase matching, if you have a waveguide, then you can get different modes within that waveguide to have different indices. You can engineer those modes to basically target specific wavelengths. And you can then have your nonlinear interactions at the wavelength that you're interested in and target specific things that you want. So uh, the engineering of the modal phase matching. The way that we do it in our lab is through the Bragg reflection waveguide. Basically, the Bragg reflection waveguide is a structure where we have Bragg mirrors at the top and bottom of our core. Generally, a waveguide would just be uh, you etch down into your uh, core and basically you guide your wave. But now you can actually, through the, the Bragg waveguide, engineer your mode to basically target specific phase matching regimes. Uh, the pump is confined using the Bragg reflector, and the signal and idler photons are guided through just total internal reflection, so the regular waveguide guiding. Um, so this is the, the, the basic structure. You input your light here. You have your pump guiding through the uh, Bragg reflectors. And uh, we're doing it on a gallium arsenide substrate. And we're using aluminum gallium arsenide layers throughout. So why do we want to use waveguides in quantum photonics? Well, we increase phase stability just because if we have temperature drift uh, in free space, then we basically just on the order of a few nanometers would totally change your phase. This is a, so if we can basically integrate this, uh, this makes it a lot easier. Increase the scalability. We can have multiple modes on a single chip, easy to scale, lower drift. Um, so instead of just the exact phase stability of any vibrations, you also have long-term uh, differences in your alignment. If there's any sort of mechanical kind of change in your setup, maybe your uh, alignment decreases over time. But you still need to couple your light in and out. So that can be an issue. Uh, I also plotted uh, some work from our earlier paper where we basically show how to generate a arbitrary two-mode Gaussian state on chip using a chip something like this, while a single mode Gaussian, an arbitrary single mode Gaussian state requires all these optical elements which each need to be aligned. So we see the complication of something like a single mode Gaussian state generated in free space requires all these different elements, a lot of alignment, a lot of trouble. But if we're able to manufacture a single chip, once we have that, it's easy to scale. So these are some old results. Uh, basically, this is polarization entanglement for, uh, from a aluminum gallium arsenide chip. Uh, it's all on one chip. You have your pump. Basically, 
we are able to show that we have counts basically throughout for uh, this is the H polarized photon and the V polarized photon. And if we're pumping at around, I think it's uh, seven, seven, seven point uh, six or something like that uh, down here, then we have this uh, polarization entanglement photons that come out and we can split it using uh, a dichroic mirror. And we see that there is still some entanglement that's left. So these are old results. At this time, we have some uh, better entanglement results that have a better density matrix. This is supposed to represent. Um, so here we have HV and VH that show that basically uh, we have some correlations on the uh, off axis. So. Uh, yeah, we're supposed to be generating something like HV plus e to the i phi, where phi is just some phase difference between the two different generations, uh, plus VH. Okay. So how do you get then the pump on chip? Well, um, aluminum gallium arsenide is a laser structure. So by adding a quantum well in the center, and then you can basically have a gold deposit on top, you can then probe that device. And basically, you can start lasing. Your, the facets of your waveguide now become reflectors for your pump. And inside the same chip, you can have a laser and a source of SPDC. Now, by engineering the Bragg layer, you can now have a source of SPDC that is polarization entangled. You can have your source of SPDC that is time frequency entangled. And we're aiming to make it time bin entangled as well. Um, so applications of something like this. Well, we have, uh, there's a paper that I cited here about uh, quantum networks using NV centers, where basically the polarization of the photons with one of the photon needs to be in the visible range to basically address a uh, NV center to trigger some nuclear spin. And then the other one, we want to target the telecom band to basically send a photon through fiber and do a bell state measurement with another NV center that is going to be targeted with a uh, with a visible photon, and these two leftover um, telecom band photons can then, with a Bell state, basically make the nuclear spins entangled. So with something like that, where we get to engineer exactly our mode, and we have a lot of their like specificity where we can with the Bragg mode, uh, target specific regions. This is one of the applications that we're targeting. Also, uh, aluminum gallium arsenide is space capable. So we could have a quantum key distribution uh, that is in space. Uh, this has already been done, but this could come from a single chip. This requires no external alignment, no drift, um, by just basically probing the device, you could now have your SPDC source. And as if you separate them, then you're good to go. Uh, so again, there's a lot of applications that we can think of for a system like this one. Uh, Phil is going to talk about a big sensing application. Um, but this is just an introductory talk on the generation of uh, the SPDC using Bragg reflection waveguides. Um, and that's basically all I have. Uh, so I'll take any questions if there are any, and then I'll move on to Phil. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 
So if I can have a single laser like this one that basically emits, um, like, you know, I have my single laser, I probe it, and then um, it emits photons. From that wafer that we've grown and we're etching, if we have one, we can have a hundred. This is like just by the matter that like when we grow the wafer, it's about like this big. And then each laser is about the width of a human hair. So if I have one, if you're etching, then basically you can etch like a hundred of them in a row. So the scalability comes with the fact that on a single chip, you can just have many at once. And I don't need any alignment to kind of deal with this. So as soon as I have one, I have 100. And as, if I have 100, then aluminum gallium arsenide has fairly low loss, uh, not quite as low as something like um, silicon nitride. So like for squeezing application, I think Xandu has the right approach to stay in silicon nitride. Uh, but it has fairly low loss. Uh, we can integrate single photon detectors on it. That has previously been demonstrated. We have a laser structure, so we could technically have a pump, a circuit, and a detector all on chip. There's no drift. There's no difficulty. And we can go straight into a scalable system that could have 100 different waveguides. Xandu has started demonstrating like in their X series, um, they have like 16 different modes. But for like when you go to when you scale to something larger, you need to start interfering by itself because there's just no way of like, I mean, we've seen it in uh, Jinwei Pan's group. They have like 100 free space modes, but like that lab looks like a nightmare. I don't think anyone wants to work there. And from from the like sheer headache that it looks like. That looks terrifying. Uh, but it is, it is what it is. To scale it to a million modes, there would just be no room in the lab. Like physically, it becomes difficult at that point. Yeah. So for which applications? For so like our applications, like we have both a FP laser that's just like a single CW. It's at 780, simple. But we also have mode lock lasers. And we're, we haven't published the SPDC results yet, but we're planning to do that. Uh, so I can't reveal too much. But we have uh, just if you have a um central absorber, then you can start having uh pulses directly on the same chip. It's not that complicated to just add some elements and without like this is all on, again on the same chip, nothing external. There's no alignment that's needed. Uh you have mode locking, pulses, etc. Uh, but that's pretty much the extent that we've done. So mode locking and CWO and uh DBRs. All right, so yeah, I'm uh, Philip Blakey, the, the other grad student in Professor Helmy's group. And yeah, thanks Zach for taking over the first part. And yeah, Amr apologizes again for not being able to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about our recent work on a sort of novel approach to a quantum enhanced LIDAR, uh, specifically how non-local effects and non-local dispersion cancellations can be used to overcome some detector time uncertainty limits that previously sort of proved to be a problem for us. So just to give a brief outline, I'm first going to talk about how time frequency correlations can make a more noise resilient LIDAR, how we can use the non-local cancellation of dispersion to enhance these temporal correlations, how we can realize this 
actually in the lab, and then some of our experimental results that were recently published. Very good. Um, yeah, so again, thanks to everyone who worked on this team with me. So first, um, I'm just going to introduce the phase insensitive classical detection that we use as sort of a base model and compare all of our results to. So first, we consider phase insensitive target detection only. Uh, the reason for this is that sort of if you want to put something on a car or a drone or just detect a drone or detect a car, or some moving vibrating target, having a phase sensitive sort of interferometric setup is going to be really difficult because everything is going to have to be phase stabilized to a, like a wavelength scale. And so any sort of movement of a vibration is going to really prove to be problematic for you. So the approach we take for the classical case is to have a light source that's emitting photon level light going at a target. It's reflected back and mixed with some environmental noise. And by environmental noise, we mean noise that is sort of uncorrelated with um, the emitting light source. We then have some detection optics and uh, an, a superconducting nanowire detector to detect the returning photons. So the way we can enhance this with temporal correlations is to actually, as Zach was talking about, use an SPDC source and take one of the photons, say the signal, and use that as a probe photon to probe the, uh, the target, collect that back, and then count coincidences, uh, temporal coincidences, with the other reference photon, uh, the idler in this case, that we've sort of locally stored. One problem with this approach, and sort of we've are, we have published a paper about this and shown that there is a significant noise resilient noise resilience advantage using this approach. Approach, but one problem is that the temporal correlations uh, between the signal and idler photons are sort of on the scale of about a hundred femtoseconds, but the detector temporal uncertainty is sort of we have about fifty picoseconds. I've seen detectors that can go down to about three picoseconds, but that's still significantly larger than the temporal correlations between your photons. And so what we've done is sort of tried to come up with a way to overcome this. And to do this, I think I want to talk about uh, time frequency entanglement first, so we can sort of describe how non-local dispersion cancellation is working. So if I have an SPDC pair, as Zach said, you have a pump photon being sort of fissioned into two signal and idler photons. And what's special about these is that you know the sum of their frequencies sums to the frequency of the pump photon. Even if you know nothing about the frequencies of either individual photon, you know everything about the sum of their frequencies. Similarly, you know that these photons were created at the same time. You don't know at what time, but you know that the difference in their frequency, uh, difference in their arrival times were I to measure them would be zero. And sort of this is uh, reminiscent of the EPR state. Um, however, instead of positional moment and momentum, it's now time and frequency. And as in the EPR case, this will sort of in the lab turn into Gaussians instead of delta functions. So just to reiterate, this means that red and blue photons with respect to the pump or half the pump frequency are created at the same time. And so the way we can understand non-local dispersion cancellation, which will be the key to overcoming this detector uncertainty is that if I apply positive dispersion to my signal photon and negative dispersion to my uh, reference idler photon, what this is doing is, is speeding up the blue photons in one of the arms and speeding up the red photons in the other arm. But what we know is that the, uh, the red and blue photons have a temporal correlation. But you can see sort of from the picture that the blue photons will still be arriving at the detector and the, as the, um, early when the red photons arrive early. And so the dispersion sort of maintains the time difference and doesn't affect your temporal correlation if, if you have these time frequency entangled photons. And so this is exactly what's going to allow us to use um, dispersion cancellation to enhance our temporal enhance our temporal resolution with respect to uncorrelated noise photons. And so you can see from perhaps the, uh, 
diagrams and this, the joint probability distributions for coincidences under different regimes. So the left-hand side is um, completely non-dispersed, just counting coincidences between my returning probe and reference on the top and a noise photon and my reference. And so the noise photon well, is um, completely uncorrelated with my reference. And what you find is that in fact, both of them are circles. They're, they're both uncorrelated. And the reason for this is that both arrival times are dominated by the det detector uncertainty. But if I apply this approach of dispersion cancellation, what I see is on the right, between my SPDC pair, the correlation has been completely recovered. However, if I look at the coincidences between a noise photon and my reference photon, everything's just spread out and it looks like a bigger version of the uncorrelated circle. So what this allows me to do is sort of filter out now everything that doesn't overlap. So everything that, in, in the first case, I have two sort of indistinguishable distributions, but now I have a bunch of my noise reference distribution that is now distinguishable from my probe reference distribution and using the appropriate time window. So if I just set my, my coincidence time window to be sort of right, I can filter out most of the noise that was previously unfilterable. Um, another way of looking at this is sort of through the lens of the fractional Fourier transform. And the idea is that this non-local dispersion cancellation preserves the correlation as you move from time to frequency. So if you take the Fourier transform of a temporal distribution, you get the frequency distribution. If you want to go to a basis between time and frequency, you use the fractional Fourier transform. And sort of this is very similar to how if you want to go from position to momentum, you use a fractional, you use a Fourier transform. But if I just think about time evolution, I'm sort of spinning around in phase space you describe a basis between position and momentum by the fractional Fourier transform. And indeed, if I just let a squeeze state or like a, an, an, X quad, an X eigenstate evolve, eventually I'll measure a P eigenstate. But sometime between, if I measure in a basis between X and P, I'll still see a squeeze state. So the, the same idea happens here where I have a sort of this time uh, eigenstate, if you will. Not exactly, but um, the correlations between time and frequency are preserved as I measure between in a different basis between time and frequency. So you can understand this as sort of sacrificing some of the initially non-measurable temporal correlations for some measurable frequency correlations that exist between the photons. So the, here are some of the results we, we have. Um, as we change the pair rate, so we pump our SPDC source harder or weaker, um, we see that the magenta line is the, our sort of new approach, exhibits a much higher uh, noise resilience than, our, than just counting single photons at our detector. Um, and so this is the, the maximum we were able to measure is uh, around 43 dB improvement in signal to noise ratio between just counting these single photons and then counting coincidences with the dispersion. So one problem for actual implementation of this is that if you have a CW noise background, so it, you're sort of only have spur, spurious noise coming in and there's no pulsing, the noise has nowhere to um, disperse to. So in order to resolve this, you'll need to modulate your noise before you disperse it. Um, but if your noise is high enough, then a priori you cannot know where your target is. And so you cannot know the correct sort of um, delay to modulate that. And the way we've sort of demonstrated that this can be achieved is by sweeping the delay and waiting until we see a higher coincidence peak than the mean and saying that must be our target because we've sort of distributed our noise among the sort of empty, unmodulated areas. So the way we've done this, um, we have a titanium sapphire laser pumping our uh, Pipflin source. We use two WDMs to separate the signal and idler photons, which then one goes to a positive dispersion fiber and straight to our superconducting detector. The other one gets mixed in with some uh, frequency filtered 
CW light, which acts as our noise, goes to a electro-optic modulator, which then applies this modulation, which we sweep the delay up. So you can see the coincidence uh, histograms here. So basically on the left-hand side, we have the non-dispersed case. And on the right-hand side, we have the dispersed case uh, with a modulation width of around one nanosecond, which is sort of the minimum width we could achieve with uh, the modulators and the modulator drivers we had. Uh, the peak width only increased by about 2.26 times. This is in principle improvable. Like you can improve this by a lot with better modulator drivers. Um, but as we sweep, so you can see sort of the, the x-axis here will be which pulse you're measuring. Uh, so you'll see a bunch of different pulses in your time delay. And then the y-axis, the vertical axis, will be uh, the delay step. And so the delay was then swept from sort of 0 to 12 nanoseconds, um, which is the repetition rate of the laser in search of the peak. So you can sort of see in a dispersed case, we see a, a bright white spot here, uh, which is about 3.58 standard deviations above the mean peak height. And so we sort of said that, I mean, we did actually know where the peak was because we can measure it. And it, it turns out that this was able to locate the peak. Uh, in the other case where there was no dispersion, you can sort of see that there's no obvious higher peak. And this is because we set the noise to be large enough so that there is no real way to distinguish the peak from noise noise peaks. So you can imagine this as that the uh, the true coincidence rate is like less than root n of the noise coincidence uh, rate. And so yeah, that's our sort of newest uh, work on uh, implementing and sort of developing a noise resilient quantum LIDAR. Uh, I hope you guys find it interesting. And yeah, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer anything. Uh,